Hello and welcome to Archie Corner. This is episode number 29, and today we will be talking about a few different things. We will be talking about travel distance, common path of travel, and how these items affect the number of exits that are required from a space. So let's get started. To begin with, let's talk about what travel distance is. It may seem obvious, but just to clarify, when we are talking about travel distance in architecture, we are normally talking about the distance that it takes a person to go from any portion of space to an exit. I am not going to get too deep into the weeds here of what is an exit as defined by the International Building Code or IBC, but if you're interested, on your screen you will see a video link coming up that talks more about this. The reason travel distance is important is because the IBC, also known as the International Building Code, limits the distance a person can travel to get to an exit. This makes a lot of sense. I mean, imagine being stuck in a building that is so long or so large that you wouldn't be able to reach an exit on time. Not a good thing. Similar to many egress requirements in the IBC, the travel distance requirements are different for every building. You can find the requirements for travel distances in IBC Table 1006.2.1. The distance may depend mainly on two things. The first one is the occupancy of the building. Different occupancies have different distance allowances. If you want to know what occupancies are, here's a link to a video that talks about the basics. The second item is fire sprinklers. Does the building in question have sprinklers? Buildings with fire sprinklers allow for a longer travel distance. Most people think of occupant load when determining number of exits, but the number of exits can also be affected by travel distances. To understand how and why, let's look at this example. Let's assume that this is a space that is 120 feet by 120 feet in size, which means that the area of this space is 14,400 square feet. Without knowing any more information, you can make some preliminary guesses as to how many occupants will occupy the space per IBC standards. Assuming this space is used for office and using IBC 1004.5, we note that the occupant load for offices is determined at one occupant for every 150 square feet. And to get the total number of occupants of this space, we simply divide 14,400 square feet by 150, which equals 96 occupants. Per IBC Table 1006.2.1, since this space has more than 49 occupants, it will be required to have two exits based on occupant load. However, occupant load alone doesn't always give you the right answer. In this example, if this exact same space was used for a warehouse, then the occupant load will change. The current IBC requires the occupant load for warehouses to be determined at one occupant for every 500 square feet. That's a huge difference, cutting the occupant load to less than a third of office space. Doing the math, 14,400 divided by 500 equals 28.8 which rounds up to 29 occupants. For the same IBC table we referenced earlier, table 1006.2.1, this space has 29 or less occupants and will therefore only require one exit if we only base it on occupant load, as we did now. But let's take a good look at this. Assuming this space is used for warehouse, we place only one exit and we place it here. But now let's determine the travel distance. We start by taking the most remote point of the space and measure the travel distance. Even if there were no obstructions and a person could access the door in a straight line, the travel distance would still be 135 feet. Now let's look at IBC Table 1006.2.1 and see what the maximum travel distance is for spaces with one exit. The maximum travel distances for warehouse, normally classified as an S occupancy, is limited to 100 feet if the building is sprinklered, 75 feet if the building is not sprinklered and has an occupant load greater than 30, or 100 feet if the building is not sprinklered and has an occupant load of 30 or less. 
Looking at our sample, since we are limited to 100 feet travel distance, we are not in compliance with building code. To be in compliance, we will need to add a door. So let's add a door to this location. Now, the furthest location from both doors is the midpoint of each side. The distance, assuming nothing is blocking the path and they can access the exit in a straight line, the distance traveled is now reduced to 85 feet. So, you see, in this instance, occupant load was not an issue. Based only on occupant load alone, we had 29 occupants, and therefore per IBC 1006.2.1, we met the requirements for one exit, based on the fact that we had 29 or less occupants. However, the second exit was triggered by the path of egress travel distance. IBC limited that distance to 100 feet, and we had 135 feet, therefore requiring the addition of at least one more exit. And so now that we understand what path of egress travel distance is, and how it affects the number of exits, let's discuss what happens to travel distance when you do need to exit. For this example, let's assume that this space is used for office. It is sprinklered and it requires two exits. Let's look at the path of travel to both exits from this location. Notice that even though there are two exits, a person must travel up to this point here before having the option to decide which direction to take. This first portion of the path of egress travel is what is known as a common path of travel, and that is also what IBC Table 1006.2.1 limits. In fact, that is why the complete header for this section is actually titled Maximum Common Path of Egress Travel Distance. If we look at the table, the common path of travel for an office use or B occupancy is limited to 100 feet in a sprinkler building. Back to our example. The common path of travel must be limited, therefore, to 100 feet or less. What would happen then if we exceeded 100 feet for this common path of travel? Well, we would have to modify our plan to reduce the common path of travel. One way of doing this, for example, would be to add a door in this location. This would then reduce our common path of travel significantly. There may be other ways to provide a solution, but this is just an example of one of them. Another solution could be to create a hallway here and providing access to the original second exit. So there may be multiple ways to provide a solution. But now, we have only discussed the issue of common path of travel. What about the rest of the path of travel? Is there a limitation to the total distance traveled? The total distance traveled is limited to the distances noted in IBC Table 1017.2, which in our case, for an office, it is limited to 300 feet if the building is sprinklered. If our building was not sprinklered, then our total travel distance would be limited to 200 feet. Whew, man, you got through all of this. Congratulations, you got to the end of this video. See, it wasn't that complicated. Man, we truly covered a lot of information. Travel distance, common path of travel, total path of travel, how that affects two exits. Man, you deserve a pat on the back. If you like this video, please share it with others. Subscribe and leave a comment, and don't forget to give it a thumbs up. If there are other subjects that you would like to see in this channel, leave it in the comments. Perhaps it'll be one of the future videos. Here are a couple of videos that you may like. Click on them and keep learning. But for now, this is Archie Corner signing out.